Muslim contributions to the U.S. is not couched in activism as a countercurrent, but as a history that helped build this country, helped form this country, helped shape this country. And so we're going to have to ask ourselves what went wrong. Why did Muslim Americans stop shaping and become reactionary, defining our community against what others say Muslims are and historically have been? Questions around the history of Islam in America and Muslim communities are also questions about identity. What does it mean to be an American? About questions of belonging. And ultimately, a larger question of, did Muslims really ever belong? What is the legacy of Islam in America? These questions arise because when you research Islam in this country, Muslims, Islamic institutions in America, what you find is that there is not much scholarly work on the history of Islam in America. When compared to critical studies of history in China or history in Western Europe, very little work is actually done here. It is as if almost that the history of Islam in this country doesn't deserve to be investigated understood and documented. And the proclamation that the US is a Judeo-Christian nation that happened throughout the past election actually aims to erase the legacy of Islam in America. Because neither history nor evolution actually happens in a vacuum, we have to consider that backdrop of the development and evolution of history as well as the ideological forces that contract and shape how we understand our history. And it's in this regard that we consider the role of Islamophobia in shaping the approach to the study of Islam in America. The term Islamophobia refers to an unfounded hostility towards Islam and Muslims. It's basically an irrational fear, but there's an end goal of this fear. It's the marginalization of Muslims from civic and political life, from social affairs, and so, so that Muslims internalize the narrative that they're new, that they never belonged originally, that they're a new community. And so an important part of the Islamophobic discourse is the representation of Islam as something monolithic, lacking diversity, lacking dynamism, something static that is resistant to change and can't really contribute much different places because it belongs somewhere else, definitely not here. Islamophobia portrays Islam as the evil other, separate. Think about the, it like this. When we speak about the Jewish and Christian heritage in the United States, but not of an Islamic heritage, is because even we start to think that it's an other, that it can't contribute to America. And we tend to think that Muslim Americans are a new ideological construct. But the history is quite rich here in the United States. Muslims were part of the US from the very beginning. Among those who served under the command of the chief of the Continental Army, George Washington, in the war against the British colonialism was Baptist Muhammad, who fought for the Virginia line between the year, uh, years 1775 and 1783, and Yusuf bin Ali, who was a North African Arab, who some claimed that Peter Buckminster, who actually was at the Battle of Bunker Hill, who led to its victory, was a Muslim, and later went on to serve in the Battle of Saratoga and the Battle of Stony Point as a Muslim American. These were all people who were under the command of the pres who would become President George Washington. But today, it seems that our current president wants to overturn that really important American principle of the contribution of the founding of this country by Muslims. Muslims were present in the Americas even before the European conquistadors. Muslims from West Africa were found here in 1312 in the Gulf of Mexico. And when Columbus made his famous journey to the United States, it was said that he took with him a book written by Portuguese Muslims to navigate around the New World. Others claim that there were Muslims, most no notably a man named Istifan, who accompanied him as the guide to the New World. The expulsion of Jews and Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula of 1492 began to witness the effects of Muslims having been in the Americas already. We see this in the architectural styles, especially not just in Muslim Spain, but what comes to be American architectural styles. Essentially, Californian style architect is Moorish style architect. 
Many of these styles of the um, old Moorish architects are found in Texas, in Arizona, and Florida, and New Mexico. Muslim presence as lived experiences throughout this architectural and aesthetic heritage has not been regarded. When we think about Muslim art contribution today, we think about young Muslim pop singers. Young Muslim art contribution was part of the infrastructure of the building of the very heritage of this country, even in terms of Californian, what is Californian architecture. In terms of the legacy of slavery and shaping Muslim identity, of the millions of Africans that were forcibly deported to the Americas, probably as many as 40 to 60% were Muslim. 20% of those were Muslim women slaves. Muslim women that wore hijab, that spoke Arabic, that taught those who were illiterate, that were among the first American Muslim ustavas. The New York Ethnological Society of the mid-19th century, which had an interest in collecting the information on Muslim staves, documented a man named Yoro Muhammad of Georgetown. Yes, Georgetown. A freed slave who bought his own house and is known for his resistance and actually continued to publicly practice Islam and was celebrated for it. In the 1930s, the Works Progress Administration went and found that there are stories of descendants of Muslim slaves, Bilali and Sahih Bilali. They spoke of their ancestors still wearing Islamic style clothing, practicing Islam, speaking Arabic. And when we see that the first manuscript produced is a manuscript entitled The First Fruits of Happiness, based on West African Maliki Islamic legal text known as Arisala. This text showed how daily life in the United States could holistically be practiced as a Muslim. These narratives help locate Muslims and African Muslims and African American Muslim women as engaged in the cultural practice of this country during its foundation. In the post-reconstruction years, this led to the great migration from the south to the north. And while these were very traumatic years, it continued to uphold identity and legacy. And this became the context of the establishment of the Moor Science Temple and ultimately the Nation of Islam. And then these two movements that aimed to educate their populations saw the new identity as a positive identity for themselves. And their identity became quickly one of struggle and one of resistance. And so it's not just in the backdrop of Islamophobia that we erase this history, but it's also in the backdrop of, of structural racism. Now the question of identity further grows in 1964, when Malcolm X breaks this question and breaks ties with the Nation of Islam and embraces Sunni Islam. Now something else interesting happens in 1964. During the Civil Rights Movement, who are the Muslims that come here? It was in 1964 that we saw the flourishing or the growth of Muslims between 1964 and 1965 in the late 60s because of the erasure of the racist um, immigration policy. It was at that year when Martin Luther King gave his I, dream of, uh, uh, I, uh, I Have a Dream speech that the MSA was established in the United States, the MSA that ultimately became ISNA. It was during that year that the great migration came from our home, the immigrant countries of North Africa and South Asia. But who were the immigrants that came? They were the scientists and the doctors and the engineers. It was the great brain drain from the Middle East, North Africa, and South Asia. There's a reason that when you go into a hospital, most of your doctors are brown, that the heads of NASA are brown, that scientists are brown. It's because the great brain drain came where all of these people, including my own parents, came and established and helped build the infrastructure of this country. Muslims are everywhere. 20,000 physicians here on the East Coast, they're driving your taxis, feeding you on the streets, heading your banks, your hospitals, they're fixing your teeth and they're paving your, they're paving your roads. Muslims both died on 9-11, but I want to talk about the construction of buildings in the United States. The U.S. would not look the way it does had it weren't for Muslims. Fazl Rahman Khan, a DACA-born Bangladeshi American known as the Einstein of structural engineering. He pioneered a new structural system of frame tubes that revolutionized the building of skyscrapers. The result of which was a new generation of skyscrapers, of Americans, the city landscape was forever changed. Without him, the World Trade Center that terrorists claiming to be Muslim brought down would not have been built. Without Khan's innovation, the frame tube structure, 
We would not have the John Hancock Tower or the Sears Tower or most of the skyscrapers that we actually see as dotting America's landscape. We would not see the 2009 Trump T Tower Hotel International in Chicago because he contributed to that as well. Muslim Americans have been part of this very fabric of this country. And the problem is that we don't know our own history. We don't know these stories. We don't know the importance of the legacy of Muslims in America. Our children need to know that they are not a new community, that they helped shape the nature of this community. And so that brings me to a question about what's going on today. The Muslim ban, and then Muslim ban 2.0, and then Muslim ban whatever manifestation it will come to in the future, it aims to target individuals who come from countries that actually led to that great contribution and growth. It tells people, those scientists and doctors and engineers, thanks but no thanks. But these were the Muslims that helped shape modern America today. The interesting thing about citizenship in the United States is it's tied to a system of rights. However, citizenship in Islam is not just about rights. It's also about duties. And so the generations that came before us, from, from, from the pre-establishment of America to its establishment, to its technological and economic growth, were part of the duty of Muslims because part of the duty of a Muslim is to be not just civilly, civically engaged, but to actually lead to the growth of where you are. What is Prophet Muhammad Sam known as? When we say the Prophet is known as a Sadiq al Amin, right? We, use, we usually translate that as the honest and the trustworthy. But what if I tell you the honesty and trustworthiness were part of the identity of Arabia at the time? It's actually not the distinguishing factor. What distinguished the Prophet is that he spoke truth to power. That was honesty. And so the question we're going to have to ask ourselves is, how do we define citizenship? What is our duty? What is our duty in speaking truth to power today? We're not only contributing Americans, just, we're not only not contributing as our forefathers help, who helped found this country, but we're also having a problem today of understanding that our duty as citizens is also to speak truth to power. As Americans who are patriotic and love our country, it becomes our civic duty to uphold justice. And not just justice for us, but justice for all, both locally and internationally, to give voice to the voiceless, to give the voice to those that have been erased. And while tomorrow in my talks I'm going to talk about what this means locally, today I want to talk about what it means internationally in lieu of what's been happening in the world in the past couple of weeks. It seems like the world is on fire. In 2016, these are the statistics of people that have died in battle, in war. In Afghanistan, there have been 23,000 casualties in 2016. In Iraq, I'm just talking about 2016, 24,000. In the Mexican drug war, there have been 12, over 12,000. And since 2006, 100,000 people have died in Mexico for the Mexican drug war. In Syria, 60,000 people died last year. And since 2011, 500,000 people have died. In Somalia, 6,000 people died last year. And since 1991, 500,000 people have died. In Yemen last year, 1,500. Since 2011, over 15,000. The top 15 countries that are seeing war, 14 of them are Muslim. You don't think the world needs an anti-war movement? You don't think the world needs an anti-violence movement? Daesh has claimed more than 33,000 lives that are primarily Muslim. You don't think we need an anti-war and anti-violence movement? But how do we do this? What does it mean to get to peace? And I really want to build on the work of our Muslim American forefathers. What does it mean for us in practical terms? If the goal of every Muslim is to attain peace, peace comes in two dimensions, of course internal, that Tamat Nina, but the external dimension is really important, of culture and civiliza civilization and society. And this is where duty comes in. When I worked at the United Nations a years ago, at the turn of the millennium, in the UN Millennium Summit, this is where they developed their millennium goals, the MDGs. And at that time, during the Y2K turn of the millennium, it was about 
what are we going to get? What is it going to take to get to world peace? And in a report at the time, the Secretary General at that time, Kofi Annan, said that, that there's two things that plague the world, that if we want to get to peace, we need to get rid of them. The first is hunger. And the second is fear. There are more people dying today of hunger than there ever have been. And there are people that fear, not just the hum of the drone, not just what a bunker buster bomb fall on us, but there are people that fear, what is tomorrow going to hold for me? Will I be able to take care of my family? Hunger and fear. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us at the end of Surah Quraysh? About those that work for change, that those that try to establish a level of change based on justice for all, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guarantee? الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُ مِنْ جُوعًا وَآمَنْهُ مِنْ خَوْفٍ Imagine that. The Allah says those that work for change, that struggle for change, they will never be hungry. And they will never be scared. He will take the fear away. If you want to attain peace like that, we're going to have to ask ourselves some really difficult questions. We know all of the slogans that Islam means peace and Islam is al hal or Islam is a solution. But if I tell you today that there is more suffering in the world and we have become blind to it. What the world needs today, what American Muslims need to do is attain a moral compass. True compassion is when you find compassion for those who deserve it the least. That is true compassion. Today our world is in need of a ton of compassion. Compassion won't lead us to look the other way when consecutive, consecutive bombs are dropped. It won't let us look away when they're even created, when that great ball of fire that sucks all the oxygen and obliterates everything in its path takes place. Compassion will make us protest against drones and landmines and perpetual growth of war economies all over the world. Since 2006, over 100,000 people have died because of the dissemination of drugs. This is tied to a war economy. Compassion won't let us remain silent on the drumbeats of war against North Korea. Compassion will not let us remain silent on the violence facing Yemenis at the hands of Saudi Arabia. Compassion will not let us ignore Syria. Compassion will not blind us to what might be the worst famine coming this summer. According to the United Nations, 20 million people in Nigeria and Somalia and South Sudan and Yemen face starvation and they They've been warning about it for months, 20 million people, and they say all we need is $4 billion to starve this off, and no one is doing anything. And the coming famine has already affected a million people. In 2011, while many countries were celebrating the Arab Spring, which is now, of course, the Arab Winter, at that very moment, 260,000 people died of starvation in the Horn of Africa, and half of them were children. Compassion will not let us look away from the fact that in the United States, drug use is on the rise, and suicide is on the rise, and youth incarceration is on the rise, and the for-profit industrial complex is growing, and healthcare is in further jeopardy, and rising college tuition is making the cost of higher education out of reach of so many. Brothers and sisters, compassion won't let us ignore this. We can celebrate the legacy of Muslims in America, but if we don't learn from it, we're missing what it means to be American. We're missing what it means to be Muslim. We can look back in history and talk about glory, but I'll tell you, the further back in history you have to go to celebrate your past, to make ourselves be feel better, is the further away you are from where we should be. And so we need to know our history. We need to know what we contributed. We need to know what our forefathers built, that we belong and have always belonged to this country, but we also not need to stop glorifying the past and we need to start doing the hard work for the future. What we need as Muslim, what we, America needs is an anti-war movement, 
an anti-violence movement, an anti-environmental pollution movement because we're abandoning the Paris Agreement and eliminating international emission and pollution standards. What we need is an anti-poverty and hunger movement. What we need is a pro-justice movement. And there is no reason that this movement can't start in this room. If you're upset about what's happening on the world today, then get off Facebook and get off Twitter and start organizing. This is what our forefathers did. They established something. If we ever needed an international rights and civil rights and justice movement, then it's today. But it's not going to happen by itself. It will only happen if we understand that Ibrahim and Musa and Isa and Prophet Muhammad were sent so that mankind upholds justice, so that Muslim Americans do their part. But first you have to ask yourself, are we going to continue to look back in history? You know the hadith that believers are like one body? If part of it hurts, then the rest of it feels the pain. And we think the pain is in all of those parts I listed, but I promise you the pain is right here. The pain is in the hands of people who have voice, people who have access, people who can do, people who can stand against injustice and do nothing. What if the entire world is waiting for us? What if the entire world is saying, Muslim Americans, you cannot just lead your nation, you can lead a movement that will change what's happening in the world. Because the rest of the hadith that we usually don't talk about said, besides pain, the rest of the body can also feel love. And it can also feel compassion. And so what we need is a revolution towards compassionate justice. The movement can begin here and today, and I'm not in the business of making my audience feel great. I'm in the business of making my audience feel that the urgency is now. And so you're going to have to ask yourself today, are you ready? Thank you.